Okay, so I wanted to briefly go over what you can see here on the screen. So just the game board and then quickly uh, touch on some mechanics before we go into a small demo of the game. So game board, pretty typical point to point map with here uh, over here the turn track, the control of the tribes and the provinces. Uh, the victory points uh, and over here uh, all the different tables uh, for, uh, for sieges, resolutions, for combat resolution, attrition resolutions. So mechanic wise, I don't know if everybody uh, read the rules already of the game, but mechanics wise, so it's a typical uh, card driven game with separate decks, however, so there is a specific deck for the Roman player. And there is one for the Barbarian player. And for the rest, it's a game where uh, usually during your turn, during your action round, you will activate leaders. There will be movement, interception, avoid battle. Uh, and then uh, finally, when leaders are activated, usually either a battle or uh, one or more sieges. That's basically in a nutshell already what the game is about. Card driven game, both players draw cards each turn, uh, will play cards until they are both uh, out of cards. And then you go through uh, some upkeep steps before you go to uh, the next turn. And basically here for this demo, I chose the Gothic Invasion scenario. So scenario 21.3 from the playbook to show really one turn what, uh, what it entails. So what the different phases in a turn, what happens during them and uh, what you can expect from a turn in the game. So here, what you see is uh, the setup for this particular scenario. So turn-wise, this is a scenario that lasts for four turns. So turn three, four, five, and six. And you can see that already in the, in the turns that have passed, which uh, we do not uh, simulate in this scenario, the Romans have already allied one tribe, the Frankish tribe, to be allied with Rome. They have settled them in Gallia Belgica. You can see in Durocortorum that, that there are allied troops there, that the Clodio leader of the Franks is there, and that several of the spaces are now barbarian, allied barbarian controlled and no longer Roman controlled. So when there is no control markers on a space, it belongs to the site whose color the, the space is circled in. So usually that is uh, the loyalist Roman. And here, Divodurum, for example, and Atuatuca Tungrorum, they are controlled by the allied barbarian power. What else is special here? So the Roman victory points are currently at five. And uh, the way to win for the Roman player is that at the end of turn six, so the fourth turn of this scenario, he should still have one or more victory points. If that's the case, he wins the game. As soon as he goes to zero victory points during the scenario or at the very end, the barbarian player will win. For the rest, so the Burgundian, Alemanni and Picti tribes begin the game, already uh, allied with the barbarian player. I have drawn us some cards in the, in the hands. I will go over them momentarily. And here at the bottom, very importantly, because the Roman player has already one allied tribe allied with them, they draw one fewer card and instead have one card here on the tribal reserve. This is a card that can only be used by the allied barbarian tribes. So that means this is now a scenario where there is just one tribe allied at this moment. That means that Rome already has one fewer option for the Romans. If the Roman player would have multiple tri tribes allied with him, his options start shrinking because a lot of what he has to do has to be done by these allied barbarian tribes. That was basically what I wanted to say briefly on the board itself, on the mechanics and on the setup of this particular scenario. Uh, maybe I can briefly show cards in the hand. So the Roman hand currently. So this scenario uh, specifically said that a Roman player may uh, start the scenario with the Flavius Claudius Constantinus card in hand. So I did that. So this card is uh, definitely already in the Roman hand. So one card is drawn into the tribal reserve and the five other cards that can be seen here. So a minor campaign, the Militia raised, the Heraclius and Maximus cards. 
I will uh, show them a bit longer when uh, we start playing the cards themselves. The Lim is at Coloniae and the Usurper killed by his own man. So those are the cards that were randomly drawn in hand. What you can see here, the black behind the card name means it's a battle card. You play it during a battle. Whereas the blue means that it's a response card. You play it usually during the opponent's turn. So that's the Roman hand, and then let's go to the Barbarian hand. So the Barbarian player could, uh, has the option, and I did it, to start the scenario with the Visigoth invasion in hand. So that with the red marker behind it, it's an invasion. It's a way to add new tribes to the game board. He also has a Vandal invasion. He also has a couple of responses and a battle card. So that's uh, the scenario that we're going to play. So a scenario, you skip the draw phase in that uh, circumstance because we already uh, drew our cards. Uh, that means a sequence of play-wise, the first turn of a scenario, you go to the strategy phase. So strategy phase is the main thing of a turn. It's really all the action rounds. So uh, the Barbarian player goes first, plays a card. Roman player uh, then plays a card and you, uh, you continue doing that until both players have played the entire hand. At that point you uh, continue to the next phase. So ordinarily the Barbarian player goes first. Specifically, if the Roman player interjects and decides to play a campaign card, they can take the first action. So if you look in the Roman hand, the Roman player does have a minor campaign card in hand. But for uh, the sake of this scenario, I'm not going to play it because Rome is more or less on the defensive. And I first want to see what the Barbarian player is going to do before I decide where I want my uh, campaign to occur, where I want to react to the Barbarian incursions. So Rome declines to play a campaign card and the Barbarian player will start the turn. So as a Barbarian player, I can see that the uh, entrance to, to uh, Roman territory is still pretty much, uh, pretty much blocked. There's already a couple of, uh, of incursions that have been made. You can see a couple of Barbarian combat units which are near the borders of uh, Roman territory. But I don't have that many tribes. I have here the Burgundians with a couple of units. But if I look in my hand, I specifically start the scenario with the Visigoth invasion in hand. So I'm going to play that, see where I can, uh, can, can bring them in, and then try at that point to uh, make, an, ins uh, to make an, uh, an invasion of Rome. As I said, it's the Roman victory points that are being tracked. How does Rome lose victory points? Either at the end of the turn have fewer than seven provinces under control, Currently, the Roman player has nine. So as a Barbarian player, I would need to take away control over three of these to already make the Roman player lose points this turn. It's, of course, also useful to already take one province or two provinces and hope to take the rest in further turns. And secondly, I can try as a Barbarian player to amass 10 plunder, because at that point, for every 10 plunder, the victory points also go down by one. These are complementary but not necessarily uh, linked objectives. Plunder you usually do with a very small group of raiding combat units that are usually eliminated at the end of their raid, but they already um, plunder uh, Rome a little bit, while taking control over provinces or taking control away from the Roman player, it usually involves coming with a big army. But indeed, I will play the Visigoth invasion card. Let's uh, look at it a little bit closer. So what I need is a physical tribal marker, the Alaric leader and 10 barbarian combat units. Okay, so Visigoth, 10 combat units and Alaric. And I can play them in the Magna Germania space. I can play them in Thuringia or in Lipsia. So as I already made a little incursion here, I will put them in Lipsia and I will do my best to do my invasion over there. So I will remove this one after play because at the bottom it says remove after play. Can only have one physical invasion during my history. And that ends already the first action round for the Barbarian player. I will go to the Romans now. 
that was a very uh, easy decision for the Barbarian player. He needs more troops, he needs more leaders, and that is a, a very strong card. On the other hand, as a Roman player, I really need to consider my, uh, my options here. Uh, the Barbarian player brought in quite some troops here on the Central Europe, let's call it. My best defense that I have there is uh, the Emperor, Theodosius Jr. Can be identified as an Emperor because he has a star next to the image. But he is only uh, accompanied at the moment by three combat units. So that, uh, that feels like he's a bit outnumbered against Alaric. Of course, there are still some combat units nearby. But I really want to reinforce uh, him there. On the other front, I have Caledonia. The Picts are there, but they are not with that many. I don't really need to do something there. Uh, the Burgundians are still matched by the Franks. In the south, there is a risk of raids, but I will have to take that risk for uh, for now because I really want. I, I think I really need to do something about Alaric, uh, who arrived. So what can I do here? Alaric clearly wants to go by one of these passes, probably uh, alongside here. I have here a Castra. I have here a Castra, so it's fortifications that he will need to uh, to go through. I have a possibility of already building a new fortress here in Valdidena. That's one of the things that I could do. I could take a, a reinforcement action and build a fortress there, a Castra, just to make sure that uh, I have a second line of defense. Alternatively, I can use uh, those points and those re that reinforcement to uh, put troops uh, with Theodosius Jr. Or I can do both. It's really... Um, a decision to make here. The events in my hand, I have a couple of cards that give me additional leaders, but right now I, uh, I don't need them. I have a good card if the Barbarian player would make one of my leaders join uh, the Usurper, but I don't know that yet. There is in my hand the Limeset Colonial card that gives me the forti fortification and the combat unit. So that looks like it's a, it's a good thing here to make sure my defense is well set up. So I'm going to play that card and I'm going to play it for the event. So it means I get two Castra, that's one, that's two Castra. And in both of them, I will get a, a loyalist a combat unit. So all of them over here. And now I have to decide. So in up to two loyalist cultivated or border spaces. I really want one in Valdidina to make sure I have a, a second line of defense there. So let's put that there already. And then secondly, here in Argentorate, there is also a bit of a, of a gap where troops could already start, uh, start coming in. So I'm going to put my second fortification there and also a troop there. And now I've uh, I fixed some of the of the holes. I still haven't fixed uh, my hole in Africa. Yeah, I will have to hope that uh, Symmachus can uh, can help me there. So I'm going to discard discard. It's it's not a removed from play if I uh, use the event. It's just discarded. So I can make more efforts in the future. I hope. So I will discard this. As you can see, the Barbarian card was removed from the game is not in the discard. If I would want to do something, because I, I was only looking at the cards in the Roman hand, if I want to do something with Clodio, I can also use, I can use the cards in my hand, but I can also use this one card here in the tribal reserve. So I'm just going to put that back there. Okay, that was, that was an entire cycle of one action for the uh, Barbarian player, one action for the Roman player. So Alaric with his, uh, with his troops sitting there in, uh, in Germania, blocked by additional force. Let's see what I can do with the Barbarian now. So one thing that's clear, the Roman player is just waiting to see what, uh, what is happening. So it's time to make things difficult for him by uh, playing the Usurper Emperor card. Just uh, to show it in large. So I, I choose a loyalist leader. And I will flip him to his usurper side. Now, what does that mean? So when a loyalist leader is flipped to his usurper side, he joins the usurper faction. And uh, part of that means that every other space and every combat unit in his province will also 
join the user perfection. So in fact, this will probably take away an entire region, uh, an entire province of the board away from the loyalist player and give it to the barbarian player, to the usurper power. Important there is obviously I cannot choose the emperor himself. He's not going to assert his own uh, rule. So what are my choices? There is here in Africa, Symmachus. There is here in uh, Gallia Vienensis, there is Arbogastes. And uh, over here in Illyricum, there is Bauto. There is no uh, leader in uh, Britannia right now, which will be an issue for the Roman player later, but I will say that uh, in a bit. And Clodio, not being a Roman, cannot usurp the throne. So that one is, uh, is safe. So looking here at the game state, at the, at the number of troops that they have, indeed it looks to me that Gallia Viennens is, is, a, is a very interesting target. It's the, it's the best leader, definitely. He also means that Loyalist Rome will be limited to the middle part of Gallia for defending coastal regions. No travel anymore through the other part of Gallia. So I'm indeed going to choose Arbogastes. So I'm flipping him. I will also flip his combat unit. I will flip Massilia. So the only thing that does not get flipped in the provinces is other leaders and the spaces where those other leaders are. As there is no other leader in Gallia Vienense, it means the entire province will join the usurper power. So what do I, do I need? I need a control marker of the usurper for Auguste Ritem, for Burdigala, for Narbo and for Kemenelum. This also means that uh, control over Gallia Vienensis is lost. That's, uh, that's already one province, and it also means uh, another uh, issue for the loyalist player, for the Roman player, to go to. So maybe I will first uh, talk about uh, the topic that I said about uh, Britannia. So, Britannia and Africa uh, being a bit more uh, remote, not, not on, the, on the continent itself. They have a specific rule that says that it's only loyalist controlled, in addition to all the other rules for control, if there is a loyalist leader in it. So you need a loyalist leader in Britannia and you need one in Africa. Right now there isn't one in Britannia, which means uh, it will not count at the end of the turn as a uh, Roman control. So the Roman player really needs to get a leader there. On the other hand, what Rome really needs to do right now is to get rid of the Arbogastes leader. An important thing about the usurper power, so Arbogastes is really striving to get the throne now, but if he would get eliminated in battle, if all his troops would be uh, crushed, everything, everything usurper on the board would go back to loyalist. Imagine there are two usurpers at the same time. Imagine Symmachus here would also decide that he would like to become emperor. At that point, eliminating one usurper leader, one leader of the usurper power is no longer enough. It's really the last usurper uh, leader on the board needs to be defeated for all of the usurpers to uh, become loyal Romans again. again. Basically, if Symmachus would also usurp and Arbogastus would be killed, Gallia Vienensis, being a rebel already against the current emperor, would join the other usurper. But right now that's not the case, there is just one usurper, and um, while he is a very good leader, he doesn't have a very large garrison, being limited to just one combat unit. So let's see what a Roman player can do about it. Let's look at the Roman hand. So one interesting thing already is usurper killed by his own man. So it's a card that you can play during battle, where the barbarian player has usurper combat units, so that would be in a battle with Arbogastes. If you would attack him with more loyalist combat units and there are usurper combat units, it's instant victory. The, the, his own man will kill the usurper, which happened uh, more often uh, than you would think. They would then disperse and it would, uh, it would just uh, be over. That would be very nice, but I can't get to Arbogastes. 
I have uh, Theodosius Jr., but it's really far away. There is a city in my way. I could go with Symmachus, but then I leave Africa, so I will need to send a new leader over there. And I'm no longer protecting the spaces in Africa from being raided by the uh, Maori in Mauritania. So two options there. I can do it with Symmachus. He's currently stacked um, with two combat units, so he would have more combat units if I if I go over there. I can take the ship to Narbo and then attack Tolosa. The alternative is that I bring in a new leader. Given that if I go to Tolosa, Arbogastes will probably go inside the city and I would have to siege him out of there. That doesn't look like a very good idea. So let's see if I have any leaders to uh, go from Hispania to Tolosa. I do indeed. I still have Flavius Claudius Constantinus. I also have Heraclius and Maximus. And I think this is actually a good uh, moment to play that, uh, that card. So I'm going to leave Constantinus in case I need him for, uh, for Britannia. And I will play Heraclius at Maximus for the event. So it means, again, he is going to, uh, to be removed after play. So let's see if I can find Heraclius and Maximus. So Heraclius should be placed in Africa. So let's put him there. Let's put him here in Saldaya. And Maximus needs to be played in Hispania. So I will put him in Taraco. And there is a special uh, extra ability there. You may discard the top card of the tribal reserve to uh, place a loyalist combat unit in those spaces. So I think I'm going to do that. I'm not planning to do much with Claudio. I hope Claudio will just defend Gallia Belgica for me. And I'm not planning to, uh, to make much war with him. So I will discard this card. Okay. And I will get a loyalist combat unit. I will just put an extra one. Ten. Okay. And I also get one in uh, with, with Heraclius. And then remove this card from play. So, while the Usurper Emperor in Tolosa was uh, not a very nice surprise, I think with uh, Maximus I can try to, uh, to do something about that. And at the same time I've put a leader in uh, Saldaya, where I can, uh, can intercept a raider to Tamugadi if necessary. Second uh, full Action round, both Barbarian and Roman player has passed. So just looking at the situation here, I don't need to do anything for Arbogastus. He, he uh, will just have to defend it. Imagine if he gets destroyed, at least it will take a lot of time and effort from uh, the Roman player. That's everything that he has to do. Alaric, I put him in play in Germania. Normally at the end of the turn I will get some migration out of his tribe. That means that he will move for free. That's a lot nicer than having to play cards and pay ops to move him. So I think I'm just going to let him stay there for now. I think it's uh, time to do some raids. To get some plunder. To start uh, uh, using the fact that there are some gaps. And try to make some more gaps if possible. So how does a raid go? It's uh, obviously an action that's only available to the Barbarian player. And it means that uh, you play a card and you get a number of combat units to raid equal to the ops rating of the card. Let's see if I have a card that I'm not uh, planning on using. So the Vandal Invasion, it's possible I'm still going to use it, but I'm not going to use the Barbarian fleet. I don't have any huge Saxons or Anglons. Those are the best ones to uh, make naval movement with. I'm just going to use this for the two ops. So I play the card. I have two ops, which means I get to raid with two combat units. And let's start here in the south. Let's see if uh, we can get past Heraclius. I have migratory barbarians. I can 
I could take two of those combat units and raid with both of them at the same time, but I think I will make two different raids here. So that means I just need one combat unit. So I'll bring him into play. Okay. And I will start going to Tamogadi. At that point, of course, I need to uh, decrease the strength that's remaining. So those two remain with Gildo and with the Maori tribe. This one is going to Tamugadi. When you activate a unit for raiding, he will have 10 activation points. And what can you do with an activation point? Move, of course. Here at the bottom of the map, there is a legend. We're taking from Mauritania to Tamugadi, we're taking rough terrain. It costs two action points, two uh, activation points. We have 10, so we have eight remaining. We arrive in Tamugadi. Normally what we want to do there is spend another uh, activation point to raid it there. But before we can do that, we need to see what a Roman player can do. A Roman player has a couple of options here. He can just make an interception from Saldaya. Of course, if he does that, he would end his interception in Tamogadi, which means other Mauritanians could then start raiding Caesarea. Let's not do that. Let's see what we have in our hand. In our hand, we have the Militia Raised uh, card. It's a response. We already talked about that. The blue banner means it can be played during the Barbarian player's turn. What does the card say? Play when Barbarian combat unit enters an unoccupied loyalist space. That's what just happened. The Mauritanian raider entered Tamugadi. Place one loyalist combat unit in that space. Okay, let's play the card. Let's uh, get a loyalist combat unit. The militia of Tamugadi will try to stop these barbarian raiders. So, we have uh, our first combat. Regardless of what's happening in this combat, if the barbarian player wins this battle and survives, he can continue with his raid. Of course, to do that, he has to survive. So, what do we do in a combat? We will use the combat table. The combat table has uh, 10 uh, different columns, one for each amount of combat units that can be participating. We are both participating with just one combat unit, so we will both use the one column. We will make a roll, both of us, with a single d6. And here are results from less than 1 to 10 plus. What does that tell us? There can be die roll modifiers. What modifiers will we have for this battle? So which modifiers are there? Superior leadership. It means a difference in tactical rating of the leaders involved. We don't have leaders involved, we can just skip that. There is combat superiority that uh, gives a plus one to die roll for defending Roman combat units. So that one we have. So we will have a plus one for the Roman. Crossing a river gives a penalty, but we're not crossing any rivers. We're not crossing straits or doing naval invasions. So no Castra, no Colonia. There was no interception, there was no failed avoid battle, so this is what we have. We roll just a d6 for the barbarian combat unit and we roll a d6 and increase it by one for the Roman one. Let's see what happens. So, first the barbarian one, the attacker, he rolls a 6. What does a 6 mean on the combat table? A 6 in the one column is 1, it means 1 loss. So. Whatever happens, the Roman is going to die. What is the Roman going to do against this? He gets a plus one. So if we look at the table to, uh, with a plus one to make that one kill to get the barbarian to die, I would need to roll a three or more. As I want to uh, continue this raid to show how, uh, how the raiding actually happens here, let's roll the die and let's look at it. It's a one, okay, we don't have to cheat or anything. We roll the one with a plus one is a two. If we look at the two, it's no uh, casualty inflicted. So that means the Roman militia that just entered is eliminated and the barbarian is still going strong. Okay. We already spent two activation points. I was raiding, I won my battle, so I will continue. What I will do is spend one more action point and place a barbarian control marker here. So now this space is barbarian controlled. It does no longer count for regional control of Africa. And more importantly, 
my plunder will increase. One plunder of the 10 plunder I need to take away a victory point. It takes some time, but there is a possibility of uh, getting more plunder here. Because I will move now to Tevestis. So I've spent two action points to get to Tamugadi. One more to plunder it. One more, because now we're traveling on Roman roads. They have only an activation cost of one. So I've spent my fourth one. Indeed, intercept. Symmachus is ready to intercept that. So when can you intercept? You can intercept whenever something moves adjacent to you. You decide you want to intercept. And there weren't already troops of the moving player in that space. Imagine there was already a barbarian army in the Vestis. Then I can't do an interception. But because this is empty space where barbarians are entering, I can intercept with Symmachus. Okay, how does this intercept work? So, I will roll a, a d6. I will add the rating of the intercepting leader, and the rating I will use is the 1 tactical rating, not the initiative, which is the 3. The tactical rating of 1 I will add, so it's a, a single bonus. And I get another 1 bonus because uh, Symmachus is a Roman. And Romans get a plus one when intercepting along Roman roads. I get a d6 plus two. Let's see what fate gives us. It's a three. Three plus two is a five. I need a six plus to intercept. So my interception failed. Symmachus stays in Carthago. At that point, I've spent only four of my action points. I will plunder more. Tevestis is plunder two. This gets me another plunder point. Okay, I have still action points remaining. I don't really care about this uh, combat unit. So let's go to Hippo Regius and let's try uh, there too. At this point, I get to uh, make multiple uh, interceptions. I could make multiple interceptions from uh, Symmachus and Heraclius. Symmachus, although he already failed to make his interception, can try another interception here on Hippo Regius. I can make both of these interceptions. I must announce both of them before I start rolling them. If Symmachus makes his interception here, I cannot then say that Heraclius will not make his interception attempt. So I will begin with Symmachus. Again, I get a plus one from his uh, tactical rating and a plus one from the Roman road. And I need six in total. I roll a two. I fail. Heraclius has the same bonuses. He has a plus one from his leadership and a plus one from uh, the Roman road. So there is my six. I succeed in intercepting. Normally, before I intercept, I need to announce which leader is going to do it and how many of the combat units he's stacked with. But in this case, he will take both combat units in order to uh, have a better chance in the battle. Now that we're getting a more interesting battle, it's still... Well, this one looks like it's going to be a Roman victory, but let's look into our hands to see, because there were some battle cards, I think. The Roman hand only had a battle card when fighting usurpers, so let's uh, ignore that one. The barbarian hand has the overwhelming numbers, so it's a plus one to the battle roll if he plays this. Or a plus four if he has twice as many uh, participating units, but that's not the case. So you can get a plus one here. It's not really interesting at this point. However, there is a very important response here. Imagine somehow that the barbarian unit would win this battle. Then he can eliminate the Heraclius leader. Not the best leader, but if we can get that one gone, why not? So... We go to the same as before, except the die roll modifiers are going to be different. Our Barbarian still doesn't have any bonuses. On the other hand, the Roman player now has a leader. The Barbarian leader doesn't. That means he has a default tactical rating of zero. Means that Heraclius, with his one tactical rating, has a plus one in the battle. Still a Roman unit that's defending, so still combat superiority. That's another plus one. And... Heraclius made a successful interception, that's another plus one. So, we're going to roll for the uh, Roman player with a plus three. Let's see what the Barbarian does. He just rolls a d6 with no modifiers. It's a one, he's clearly completely demotivated in this battle. One combat rating, a one is zero hits made. Let's see the other side. 
So we have two combat units, which means we do on we roll on the two column. We have a plus three modifier, so let's roll. It's a two modified by a plus three is a five. If we look here, five in the two column is one hit. That's enough. So this barbarian unit is eliminated. And Heraclius and his troops are now here at Hipporegius. What's the situation after this raid? After half of this raid, because we only spent one of our ops yet, we have another raid going. But the barbarian player got two plunder, and some spaces in Africa are no longer loyalist controlled. Maybe a brief aside now on provincial control. To control a province, the Roman player needs to control the capital, the provincial capital of that province. In Africa it's Carthago. And then he needs to control of all the spaces, so walled city spaces, cultivated spaces, etc. He needs to control over half of them. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 spaces in Africa, so he needs 5. He lost 2, so if now Caesarea would also be lost, then he is still just hanging on to control over Africa. Let's then see what second rate are we going to do. We have some options. What we can do is do a second raid from Mauritania. Take another combat unit there, go to Caesarea, that one we can raid with no problem. And then go to Saldai, that one we can also try to raid. Of course Heraclius can again intercept that. Other options that we have, so there is several Castra and, and soldiers over here. You can of course do a raid through an enemy troop, but that, uh, that comes with the, with the risks. There is a possibility to make a raid here to Mursa. Of course, Bauto uh, is ready to intercept that. The final option there, raids you can really use for two different things. You can use them to get plunder uh, what we, and, and to uh, take away spaces like what we were doing in Africa. That's the main use of, of raids, in fact. But the second thing you can do with that is try to get those one, one combat unit against one combat unit battles. You have 50% chance, a roll of a 4, 5, 6, to, uh, to make a casualty. And often there is just one combat unit on the border. So that's something that could be done over here. To clear the way to get into, for the Picts to get into Britannia. Let's do that. Let's take one of these uh, combat units. So we lower this to one and we take another one. And we start raiding. I'll clue it. You can see it's, uh, it's here in blue on the sea. It's a port. Why are we raiding over land if it's a port? To raid over sea, you need specific leaders to, uh, to join you. You need the Saxon or the Anglon of the, or the Jude leader. So we don't have their uh, naval leadership and their naval knowledge, so we go over land. We take this rough road that can be seen here. Maybe I zoom in a little bit. We take the rough road from Alcluid to Deva Vitrix with this one barbarian combat unit. We instantly get into a fight. As I said earlier, we were not attacking over the border on the Rhine, the Donau, the Danube, because it's well defended. The thing there is, you can evade the Castra if there is no garrison. This, gar uh, this Castra in Deva Vitrix, it has a garrison. So we have to pass. Uh, we, we cannot just pass through that, we have to fight. Hadrian's Wall, indeed. So, combat, once again, we're just one against one. These are just some, this is really a war of attrition of uh, the barbarian against the few Roman legions still uh, standing there. What DRMs do we have? Uh, the barbarian once again has none. The Roman still has his combat superiority. And now, because there is a Castra in the space, he also gives a minus one to the roll of the Barbarian. So that means that a Barbarian now only hits on a 5 and a 6, and the Roman hits on a uh, 3 to 6. Why is this still valuable, in my opinion? Because the Barbarians are much easier to replace than the Romans. So you don't really care about the plus one that he has, and eliminating this unit is really valuable, because all of these spaces become available for raiding then. Let's roll for my Barbarian, which is minus one. So he rolls a two, 
he doesn't make a hit. Then let's see for the Roman. Here also five. So this brave barbarian doesn't do the same good work as the Maori one and gets eliminated just on his move. So that was two ops, two different raids. That means that our card here is played out. We will discard it because we used it for the ops, regardless of uh, whether it's a remove from play card or not. And we will go to the Roman player again. So, situation. Last turn, we added some leaders here in order to attack Galliafianensis and Arbogastes, who is in Tolosa. These raids of the Barbarian player didn't really change much of that. We have left Caesarea open. We would like to not have done that. One option to do here is wait still a little bit for the attack on Tolosa and use this turn for some forced marching. What is forced marching? Forced marching is something that's similar to a raid in that you get a lot more activation points for movement and you don't need a leader for the movement. You can just do it with combat units. Normally to move you need a leader. This would be a very good way for the Roman player to get some more troops to Maximus in Tarraco. However, if I look at my Roman hand, I'm already down to just three more cards. It's, it's a question whether we will have enough time to, um, to attack uh, Arbogastus there. In fact, forced marching would give us, for each ops that we play, two combat units that could do a forced march. But we actually don't have that many Romans on the board right now. Forced marching is very good after the reinforcement phase in the turn, but we aren't there yet. We're just at the setup and we have mostly troops at the border and they need to stay there. And we have troops on our walled cities and we also want to keep them there uh, for, uh, for defense, for garrisoning. So what will we do then? We want more troops in Taraco. Let's take a reinforcement action. For a reinforcement action, what do we need to do? We need to play a tree card. I imagine we will be able to defeat Arbogastus or start a siege against him because he will probably cowardly get into his capital. So he won't need the usurper killed by his own man. So let's play this card just for the ops. So I play it here. Uh, reinforcement works differently for each power in the game. So for the loyalist power, what it does is you choose two provincial capitals and in each of them you place one combat unit. Tarako, luckily, as you can see by the underlying name, is a capital, uh, a provincial capital. So I will place one combat unit there. And then I need to choose another one. I can take uh, Carthago, but I think I will choose Mediolanum to give uh, my emperor there a little bit uh, more troops in order to defend against Alaric if he will ever cross the Danube. So I chose two provincial capitals, Taraco and Mediolanum. I placed the loyalist combat unit in each of them. Specifically here for the loyalist, one of these combat units I could have replaced with a Castra or Colonia marker. Well, a Castra marker or upgrade a Castra to a Colonia. But given that I already added some uh, this turn, I think I will go with the combat units. The card played for ops is just discarded. Play returns to the Barbarian player. Barbarian player still has four cards in his hand against the two cards of the Roman player. This actually means that the Roman player, when it's uh, his action again, can choose to pass. You can only do that if you have fewer cards than your opponent. But at this point, that is true due to uh, the play of um, response cards and the discard of the tribal reserve earlier this turn. The Barbarian player, however, needs to play something here. Taking more raid actions at this point is definitely uh, an option. Just to go through my thought process, so I really don't want at this point to move Alaric. At the end of the turn, we will see that because we will normally go to, to that phase. He will get a free move to uh, Castra Regina. I really want, uh, want to do that uh, for free. 
I don't really want to uh, waste time moving Vuradek and try to uh, get through Hadrian's Wall. That's too difficult. So why indeed not do some more raiding? We have uh, a, a shot at Saldae. Let's do that. So I don't expect that loyalist combat units are going to move along rough connections. That's what the ambush card does. That is a very useful card in earlier scenarios when uh, Rome is still invading Germania or uh, Caledonia. It's useful when there is a lot of activity in Hispania because there are also some connections like that. But for now, I'm just going to play it for the ops. So once again, I get two ops for raiding. I can split them. I can, I can keep them combined. I will split them. I will just go with a single barbarian here. But this is an option that I have. I am going to take Gildo along because I expect that I may uh, get into a battle with Heraclius. So let's give ourselves some modifiers there. Okay, two activation points needed to get to Caesarea. And then there is nothing at this point that a Roman player can do about that. He can't intercept here. He already played his response cards. So we will simply place our control marker there to indicate it's plundered. That is our third activation point and also our third plunder point. Now we get to make a choice. We can go to Tingis and fight there and cross into Hispania and then do all the nice raiding that's there. But let's go to Saldai. Costs us one more point, so we that's our fourth point that we spent. We go into Saldai. Normally there would be a, an intercept here from Heraclius. But let's just assume that Heraclius fails his intercept roll there, because otherwise we will just get another battle. And we've seen that already. Let's see what happens when we raid a walled city. So, important about uh, raiding walled cities, we cannot end our raid there. If this was our last raid move, we could not do this. Basically, what we did in Tamugadi, what we did in Caesarea, we were really going to those small villages, townships that are there, maybe towns, but certainly not large walled cities. We were burning them all down and getting all the loot. When we're now going to Saldai, that's, a, that's a, a walled city. It's got a lot of fortifications. What we do there is we raid some, we plunder some, we move further. So all we need to do is go there and we get one plunder for free because we're just marching through it. We don't do anything about it. We don't flip it. It remains a Roman city. They are just a little bit poorer. What we need to do then is, well, we need to continue our movement. We could go there and go back to Caesarea and do that Hispania story that I said. We can also uh, go to Hippo Regius, try to defeat Heraclius and uh, start raiding there. Let's just go back. We don't want to face uh, Heraclius, but let's take our plunder from Saldai. Now, we've spent two, three, four, five activation points. We have 10, well, because we're raiding. Why don't we just go back to Saldai, go back, go back, go back, and take all the plunder? Because there's a limitation there. You only get that once per ongoing raid. They are not stupid enough to keep their valuables outside. Let's continue. Let's go to Tingis. And let's see if we can cross into Hispania. So what I was saying earlier about raiding not being allowed from port to port, going, uh, doing naval raids, unless you have the Saxons, Anglons or Jutes, um, that does not count here for my invasion on Hispania, because as you can see, it is a strait. So we will just cross the strait, the pillars of Heraclius, and get into Hispania that way. But first we need to defeat the garrison of Tingis. So we have a battle again. This time we have bonuses for the barbarian. We have superior leadership. Our leadership, Gil, our leader, Gildo, has a leadership of one. The Romans don't have any, so we have a plus one. The Romans, however, still have their plus one for combat superiority. That's it what we have there. So we both have a plus one. Let's roll the dice. So let's first see for the barbarian. Here also two. 
it's increased by one for a three, it's a zero. Let's see what a Roman player does. Also makes a roll, he rolls a three, increased by plus one for a four. So let's execute that and let's then go back and imagine the Roman was defeated so that we can continue our raid into Hispania. If we stayed with the rolls that we made, what would happen is the Roman combat unit would survive and the barbarian combat unit would be eliminated. What does this mean? The final combat unit of Gildo is eliminated. This means that Gildo would be displaced and would be moved to the displaced leader's box and would remain there until the end of the turn. And at the end of the turn, he would be returned to his tribal marker here in Mauritania. But imagine that didn't happen. In that case, this brave Roman combat unit would be eliminated. At this point, we have spent two uh, action points to get to Caesarea, one to plunder it, one to go to Saldai and one to go back, that's five. One to move into Tingis, that's six. So at this point, for our seventh, we place a barbarian control marker. We get the plunder. We have three points remaining and we cross into Mons Calpe, the Roman name for what we now call Gibraltar. At this point, our 10 action points are gone. We cannot plunder Mons Calpe, but we have plans for the future. All of Hispania is open for raids for us now. There is no defenders in sight. This is really a problem for, uh, for the Roman. He really needs to, uh, to do something now. And that was only our first raid, wasn't it? Then we already do have problems for the Roman. Because we have a second ops point here. We played the ambush, two ops points, we only spent one. Let's take this other Maori troop here. He can easily go away from his tribal marker. So he can easily go away from the tribal marker because the tribal marker is here in the Mauritania zone. And the Mauritania zone is off limits for the Roman player. So, we move to Tingis, that's two uh, action points. We move into Moscalpe, that's three more, so we've spent five. Let's go to Gades, that's six. Let's place a control marker, that's seven. Let's go to Augusta Emirata, that's eight. Let's put a control marker, that's nine. And let's then go to Felicitas Julia. So, that's ten. We place two more. Uh, markers, so we get two more plunder. And of course, the Roman victory points don't change. So we already had seven plunder. This was a very, a very good uh, action round for the barbarian player. And let's say the Roman player really needs to do something here. And we discard the ambush card. What do we see now, however? There is a barbarian unit here in Felicitas Julia and a barbarian unit with Gildo in Mons Calpe in spaces that are currently controlled by the Roman player still. This means that at the end of the turn there will be an attrition roll made for those units if the spaces are still not barbarian controlled at that point. Of course we hope as barbarian player that we will raid them and that uh, we will be safe in them. Regardless of the fact that there is an attrition roll made, if they survive the attrition roll, then they do gain control over the space. Well, after the attrition phase, if they survive, they will place a control marker and gain the plunder. So even if we don't do anything here, it can still turn out fine. Well, this was bad for the Roman player. Also, five spaces may be lost in the future. Of the 11 spaces of Hispania, that's already a good way into taking control of that province, or at least taking control away from the Roman player. Let's see what a Roman player can do at this point. So we have two cards remaining. We have Flavius Claudius Constantinus, which can get us a leader in Britannia. We need that. We don't have a leader in Britannia right now, and that means it doesn't count for victory points. And maybe more importantly, we have this minor campaign. What can we do with the minor campaign? We activate two leaders. This means that we 
can stop what's happening in Hispania and still do what we need to do against Albogastes in Gallia. Let's see what we can do with that. Let's begin with that. We could, as I said earlier, we have two cards. The Barbarian player has three cards. We could pass, but passing here means, I think, that we lose all of Hispania. So let's not pass. Let's try to do something about it. So let's play this minor campaign card. Does, what do we do with that? We activate two leaders using this card's ops. What does that mean? To activate the leader, normally you need to play a card with an ops value equal to or lower than the initiative rating. This is a new value that we encounter now. So Maximus, for example, has an initiative rating of 3. What does this mean? Here, on the right side of the board, we see the leader activation table. So you see the ops that you used to uh, activate the leader, and then you cross-reference that with the initiative rating. So, as this is a 3 ops card that we activate leaders with, we look in the 3 ops card row. We want to activate Maximus to go to Tolosa. So, let's see, initiative rating 3, 3 ops card, we would activate it with 4 action points. That means, if we want to do that, we can move to Kaiser Augusta. We can then spend two action points to go to Burdigala, and then we can move to Tolosa. We will be in enemy territory, we will not have taken Burdigala back, but we could do that. Alternatively, uh, for example, Sain Maccus could start from Carthago. He could go by naval movement, that costs three movement points. He could go to Narbo, <coughs> and then from Narbo he could go to Tolosa. Actually, I now realize I can just go back via Narbo, which is a much shorter route. That is probably a lot better. So that's definitely what we're going to do. We're going to take Maximus and we're going to Narbo and then to Tolosa. What do we do about these barbarians here, however? There is very little we can do about the barbarian in Felicitas Julia. He will be able to raid the north of Spain, I'm afraid. However, what we can do is at least take Heraclius from Hippo Regius or Symmachus from Carthago and go to one of the ports and then move to cover Toletum from where we can intercept Kaiser Augusta and Cordoba or we can go to, uh, to Cordoba itself. What we can also do is just move to Monscalpe and just take out Gildo uh, like that. Uh, finally, if I would take Maximus and I would take the road over uh, Kaiser Augusta and Burdigala. Of course, what I could do is drop a combat unit in Kaiser Augusta, which would also give problems to the raider uh, in Felicitas Julia. Finally, what I can do with this campaign is just cover all of Hispania, take Maximus into the west and take Symmachus or Heraclius in the south. At that point, however, I'm not doing anything about Arbogastes, and I think he is more important. So, I play the minor campaign. I will first activate Maximus. I have four act activation points. So, I will take the entire garrison of three combat units, because I need three combat units to be able to siege. Uh, I will move into Narbo. Arbogastes could make an interception there, but he prefers to remain in Tolosa. With my second action point, I will flip the control marker. In fact, I can just delete it because it's printed on the board. And with my third one, I will move into Tolosa. At this point, I'm moving into a space containing a fortification. That's Walt City, Castro or Colonia. So there's a choice to be made for the non-facing player. Arbogastes can choose to go into the garrison of Tolosa. And he decides to do that. At this point, I have Maximus outside the city, Arbogastes inside the city. This means I can start making siege rolls. A siege roll costs two action points. I already spent three of my four, so I can't do a siege right now. I will be able to do a siege later on or in future turns, as long as I do have three combat units or more in the space. Second activation with my minor campaign will be, it's a difficult choice, Heraclius has an initiative rating of 2. That means with the 3 ops card, 
he will have five action points, whereas if I take Symmachus, he will only have four action points. So indeed, I have choices. I can activate Heraclius with three action points. That means he could go uh, with five action points. He could use three of them to go to Nova Cartago, then one to go to Cordoba, and one to go to Monscalpe. I can also just use three to go to Monscalpe immediately. But when you do a naval landing like that, you get severe penalties. So you always want to go to an adjacent port and then move over land. Finally, what I can do is do the safe but maybe less exciting thing of going to Valencia and then moving to Toletum and cover some spaces, but not all. And Toletum to Cordoba, it is a rough terrain, so it will be harder to intercept. Let's do a fight. I will take Heraclius. I will move him to Nova Cartago. I will take both combat units with me. And I will even pick up the troop in Nova Cartago when I continue my movement. So I still, I activated him I had, with the three ops card. I had five action points, three action points to move to Nova Cartago. And then I will move him to Cordoba. There is an option here for Gildo to intercept. What is the problem with uh, attempting that intercept? If you attempt the intercept, you cannot afterwards evade the battle, avoid the battle. Gildo isn't sure he's able to avoid the battle, doesn't see the value in that, so he's going to try for his intercept roll. So, interception, same as what we said before. So 1d6 plus 1 for the tactical rating of Gildo. But, because Cordoba is still from the Roman player, there is a penalty of 1. So 1d6 plus 1 minus 1, and we need a 6 or better, so Gildo needs to roll a 6. He rolls a 3 which means his interception failed. At this point, my final action point, I'm moving Heraclius and his troops into Monscalpe. Let's do a fight there. What I'm doing now is probably give a lot of plunder to the barbarian player, but at least get rid of Gildo for some time and have some troops left here. In fact, I will leave one combat unit in Cordoba in order to at least protect that space. So, there is a battle here. Heraclius with two combat units against Gildo with one combat unit. We still have a battle card in the hand of the Barbarian player. So let's play this, because we want to maybe kill Heraclius. We will play this card. So first option is always for the uh, attacking player to play his battle card. That was non played. And then it's to the defending player to play his card. So, a battle. Uh, once again, let's check the, uh, the DRMs. We uh, compare the leaders. There's one uh, leadership for Heraclius versus one for Gildo. It's just a zero difference. The Roman player is attacking across a clear connection. They're taking the Roman road, so they still have combat superiority. Combat superiority is a plus one for the Roman if defending or if attacking along a Roman road. So plus one for the Roman. And that's all the modifiers, but of course, there is the plus one of the overwhelming numbers battle card for the Barbarian. So both sides will have a plus one modifier, but the Roman player is rolling on the two column and the Barbarian player is rolling on the one column. So let's see. Roman player rolls a one. Bad luck for the Romans. Uh, modified with plus one for two. So we are just short of killing this unit. On the other hand, Gildo, uh, let's see what they roll. He rolls a 3, modified by the plus 1 of the overwhelming numbers is 4. That means on the 1 column it's 1 casualty, so 1 Roman is eliminated, and the Barbarians won the battle. This means the combat unit, well, Heraclius and his remaining combat unit has to retreat to the space where he came from. Gildo uh, successfully won there. This means also that he will gain one plunder for every two Romans that were killed. There was only one killed, so no plunder for Gildo. Heraclius now wishes that he had taken the other combat units along, but he didn't. So Heraclius is now here. Luckily, that means that he's available for intercepting into Toletum. Or is it? Let's discard this overwhelming numbers card and let's go to the Barbarian hand again and let's play General in Disgrace. Heraclius has disgraced the eagles of Rome and he's 
eliminated. So it means it's not even going to the displaced leaders to come back. No, he's permanently gone. And we will discard this general in this grace card. So minor campaign is finished. Let's discard this one. There is still a couple of cards in the, in the, well, there's one card in the Roman hand and one card in the Barbarian hand. I will simply play them for their effect. So I will put some Vandals in play and I will put uh, Constantine in play so that we can then go to the other phases of the turn to quickly end this demo. Uh, so the Vandal invasion, I'm going to play it, but I'm not going to place them because we are going to wrap up after this turn anyway. And in the Roman hand, we still have uh, that one I'm, I'm going to play. We're going to put Constantinus uh, into play because we need that one, as I said earlier. We need that one in Britannia. So let's just very quickly take his marker here. Okay. So let's put that one in Londinium. And then we can go to the uh, remaining phases. So very briefly, I will, uh, I will say which ones they are. There is an attrition phase, a control phase, a migration phase, a scoring phase, and a reinforcement phase. First attrition. We only need to look at combat units on enemy spaces. So where do we have combat units on enemy spaces? I think we have still this uh, one guy in Felicitas Julia. So let's just quickly roll. We roll a three. We look at the attrition table. There is just one combat unit. We roll the three. He is just fine. In Monscalpe, we also have one. So let's roll there. It's a four, still on the one column. That's no problem. And then finally, we have this army of Maximus. He's also on an enemy controlled space, Tolosa. He's with three combat units. So we roll on the three to five table. Let's see there. We have a three on the three to five table. That's one loss. We're going to ignore that for the purpose of this demonstration because I need him to have three combat units for the next step. So what is the next step is the control phase. Control phase, you do three different things. First, you look at occupied unfortified spaces. So what is that? For example, Felicitas Julia. Felicitas Julia at this point becomes barbarian. So we put a control marker there and yay, we get some more plunder. The same happens in Monscalpe. Control marker and plunder. Those are the two unfortified spaces that were not controlled where we had an attrition roll. Then on a fortified space that's uh, enemy occupied, if you have three or more combat units, you do a siege. So this gives us a siege roll also. So let's do that. We have Tolosa, we have three combat units outside, we can make a siege roll. You can also make siege rolls during the turn, just activate the leader if he has three or more combat units and you spend two activation points. But this one during the uh, control phase is free, it doesn't cost any ops. So what do we do? We roll a die roll, we get a plus one DRM if the leader is Roman. So luckily Maximus is still Roman. So we're just going to make a roll. We roll a one. The Roman is not rolling very well. We get a plus one, so that means two. On a two, it means zero siege points and also zero combat units uh, lost on the besiegers side. Let's imagine we had scored a siege point or even two if we had rolled a six or more. What do you do with siege points? You eliminate uh, combat units from the garrison. So that would be the one combat unit from Argogastus if we had had one siege point. And if at that point it's ungarrisoned and you have another siege point, so imagine we had rolled a five or six and modified to a six or more, we would have had two siege points. The first one would have eliminated the combat unit. The second one would have ended the siege. At that point, Argogastus would have been eliminated and all of Gallia Vienensis would have become loyal again. Because we now have... No siege point or even one siege point would just have sufficed to kill Arbogastus' garrison, making it easier to win the siege next turn. But here, 0-0, zero, zero, we don't lose anybody from the uh, besieging army, but we also inflict no damage. And then finally, in the control phase, you look at usurper spaces and you see, do they still see a usurper leader? Because imagine that Arbogastes had taken a boat 
and had gone, I don't know, to Illyricum and tried to do stuff there, the, the people in Gallia Vienensis would no longer have supported him and they would have become loyal again. So as, as usurper emperor, you really need to keep something, troops or, or leaders or yourself, uh, nearby to keep the loyalty of, well, the loyalty of your usurpers, the ones who weren't loyal to the emperor. This is merely a rule to, uh, if there is nothing left, you can just walk over the spaces and take control back. It's to, uh, to remove that uh, element from the game. You just get them back instantly. Okay, that's the control phase. Then we have the migration phase. During the migration phase, tribal markers must be migrated. So migration is something that we can do during a turn. We haven't done that during this turn, but during the migration phase, you must do that. And you have to look on the turn marker, so on turn one you have the first wave, starting in turn three, and we are in turn three, you have the second wave. At that point you must move one space, but you may move another one. So my Maori here, for example, they must move one. Now the exception there is they are in a box, so they don't have to, but they could, if they wanted to, could move one or could even move two to join their leader. I will put, keep them in Mauritania because they're safe there. But here, for example, the pigs of Vuradeg, they must migrate. And they must migrate at least one space. So they will go to Alcluid or to Din Aden. Or, in this case a bit silly, they can go to Din Aden and then go to Alcluid. Not that silly actually, because you can't take anything with you. So what you can do is you migrate to Din Aden and then to Alcluid. You take the two troops and you take everything from uh, Caledonia. And now you have an army here ready to invade Adrian's wall. The same here. You get a movement with the Visigoth tribe. Now we have 1 plus 10, we have 11 combat units here. Normally a leader can only take 10 combat units. But as is a migration, you can take anything you want. So the Visigoths will move. They skip these little spaces. They're only for movement for leaders and raiders. The tribes skip that and they move instantly here to Castra Regina. And they again can take anything they want. So Alaric didn't have to cross the Danube here. It was already done for him and the tribe just goes. And now here, he does face some castra, some uh, hard sieging ahead of him, but at least he has crossed the Danube and he's into the Roman Empire proper. The same here for Burgundians, they will also have to move. Obviously, the allied barbarians, the Franks, they don't migrate. They are settled now in Gallia Belgica. Uh, that's a migration phase and it's a scoring phase. So let's see. Because uh, the last action round we went a bit uh, fast. Britannia Romana is still a, a Roman. Gallia Belgica, still Roman. The Allies count. Gallia Lugdunensis, still Roman. Gallia Vienensis, no. The Boat Italias, yes. Illyricum, yes. Hispania, yes. And finally, Africa also. So we still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces. That's more than seven. This means we gain a victory point. Now, if we had played the turn a bit differently, we would, of course, have taken Hispania away from him if we had done those raids in the last action round. Uh, but in this case, the Roman player gains a victory point. But plunder is already at nine. It's almost down a victory point again. And then finally, we get into the reinforcement phase. During the reinforcement phase, every uh, power will gain reinforcements, rather similarly to um, the reinforcements that you can gain during the turn by playing a three ops card. Each barbarian tribe has a number on it. The Picti have one, but for example, the Visigoths have three. That means that many combat units are added. So three Visigoths, three barbarian combat units are added to the Visigoths. Two are added to the Burgundians, one is added to the Picti, one will be added to the Maori here. So that's for the uh, migratory barbarians. In Durocortorum, the Franks, because they are loyalists now, they, they also get, they get one single allied barbarian. The usurper, he gets two combat units with each leader who is not besieged. So that means Arbogastes gets no fresh combat units. And the Roman 
player, the loyalist power, gets one combat unit in each uh, provincial capital that they control. So not Durocortorum, because it's controlled by the Franks, but for example, one in Taraco, one in Carthago, one in Roma, one in Mediolanum with the Emperor, and so on. Finally, if we had displaced leaders, they would also return now, Romans to uh, any space containing Roman combat units, and barbarians to their tribal marker. Finally, we advance the turn marker, and what do we see? We see on turn 4, it says Honorius. That means it's an emperor name, an imperial name. That means our current emperor, Theodosius Jr., dies. So let's permanently eliminate him. But luckily, we get a replacement. And our replacement leader is the next emperor, his son Honorius. And Honorius, as you can see, is the worst leader in the game with an initiative rating of 3, that's really bad, and a tactical rating of 0. That would not be bad because you can use other leaders, but if he's in a stack because he's the emperor, he's always the commanding leader. So, Alaric crossed the Danube, and our best defenses here are Emperor Honorius. And that is how uh, turn 4 would start. We went through an entire turn of the scenario, 4 turns, and at the end of turn 6, so the 4th turn of the scenario, we would check the victory points. If Rome still has victory points remaining, they win. As soon as they are at 0 at the end of a turn, the uh, scenario is over and the Barbarian player wins. That, uh, that was it, and I uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, and I hope you had something. It's, it's useful for you. And uh, I hope you get many nice games of Barbarians at the Gates.